growing uh, in the states where it's legal. So we're, we're in Colorado now. We just signed all the paperwork to go into California. So we'll go, go over there with our two. And then after that, we'll go to the next state where hopefully it'll be New York and then um, uh, Illinois and just keep moving from state to state, growing and growing with our two brands. Once, once we're national, then we'll start rolling out a lot of other flavors. So, uh, cause I've got a ton of flavors that we've been playing with. And so that's, I love that you already have like the business model to, you know, obviously grow not only in the state, but also in the region and then go nationwide. And I mean, obviously those four states are pretty key in, uh, you know, the markets and how they're, you know, like how New York goes, the whole country goes. So we're starting to see more dominoes starting to fall. And so mm -hmm. once you kind of get your foot in the door in those markets and in those cities, I mean, I can only expect to see this everywhere. But my question, I guess, for our listeners, you know, we have a large contingency here in Colorado. Where can we get it? And also, is this, is your brewery like one that, and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what's going on with Colorado about to start with the, uh, the cannabis clubs and things, are you going to have a tap room and things along those lines? But for the first question, where can we get these uh, beers that if everybody wants them, where can we get them here in Colorado? So yeah, our cannabis beers can be found in most dispensaries here in Colorado. Okay. Got to be 21 or older to go into a dispensary and buy, buy products. Um, so. Yeah, we, we got that, doctor. Uh, <laughs> I was, I was going to have to call you doc at some point, so I figured I'd do it on the, the obvious point. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's uh, most dispensaries, um, uh, gosh, uh, who, uh, Terrapin Care Station, uh, Green Solution. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the uh, chains, as well as yep. dependents, and uh, it just go in. And, and our products are, are pasteurized, so... Uh, we prefer that they be sold cold so people can take them and drink them right away, but you, you may find them warm. Uh, so they're perfectly safe uh, to be purchased warm, take them home, chill them down and, uh, and then drink them. But yeah, they're, uh, they're pasteurized. So they're safe. Oh, okay. I like it. So you mentioned a little bit about, you know, the tra trajectory of the plants and hopefully legislation kind of coming back around on the whole bullshit from the 19 teens or what have you. Mm -hmm. what do you what do you see going for the denver scene like are you going to open a tap room are we going to eventually start seeing cannabis consumed you know like everywhere and so your beers will be in walgreens what what do you think is going to happen with our new legislation that just passed on 420. i think there's still going to be a separation of cannabis from alcohol and co consumption lounges lounges for cannabis versus bars i don't think that we're going to see the blending anytime in the near future, uh, because I think there's still a, a lot of fear on the government's part. Uh, and also from the perspective of, uh, well, a whole bunch of perspectives, uh, health people, everybody advises against mixing alcohol with cannabis. And, um, and there's some reasons for it. I, I cover them in, in my book, but uh, uh, the primary reason is uh, when you consume cannabis, uh, a lot of people do it uh, for reasons of when they, when, they're, when they have cancer and, and they uh, take all that medication, the, the chemo, that makes people throw up all the time. They get the leaves. And one of the, one of the cures is, cannab is cannabis because when you smoke cannabis, the, the curve, the nausea, and it'll kind of create an appetite for those patients and things of that nature. It does that, but but more than that, what it does is it relaxes that nerve in the back of the throat that makes you throw up. It's called the vagus nerve. And when you're on chemo, that nerve gets, it gets activated and you feel like you got to throw up all the time. So cancer patients, if they, if they smoke pot, they that nerve relaxes and so they don't have to throw up all the time. So all their nausea goes away. So the, the, the reason I bring that up is because if you're smoking cannabis and all of a sudden you, you start uh, drinking alcohol, you can do shots and shots of, of like tequila. And, and at, at some point, most people, you do a ton of shots, bless you, <laughs> bless you. So most people, uh, tequila, you do a ton of shots, and then when you get to the point where you you start to you'll throw up because you've done too many shots, and so you to avoid you know getting sick and getting blood poisoning and and potentially dying from alcohol, your body naturally goes blah, and you throw up all that. 
tequila. But if you've been smoking pot, that nerve is relaxed. So you can drink your, yourself to death, theoretically, if, you're, if you combine too much alcohol with too much pot. And so that's, that's one of the reasons a lot of the health professionals uh, are going to push against combining any kind of consumption lounge where you have both alcohol and pot. So, and they, and, and there's some scientific articles that actually talk about that. And so the, they'll bring that up. And, and I'm sure because of that, we won't ever see the mixing of the two. Damn. Well, I mean, at least we can still sell the shit out of your non-alcoholic cannabis beer, you know, in normal dispensaries and things of that nature. But I guess we'll have to wait before we can see it on the shelves at local 46. Yeah. 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 You're right. Cause uh, it, it's uh, it'll be a while. Uh, but in the meantime, most people, you know, they, if they want to just go to a dispensary and drink it and uh, uh, you know, have, have a joint or, or do, do a dab rig, uh, they can they can do that and just have some fun with it. So quick question for those that are kind of on the fence because edibles oftentimes will hit, you know, a, a new becomer or a new, whatever, new becomer, Ugh, I'm high. Um, let's say, you know, like, is it one of those buzzes that it all hits you at once? Like you're like, oh shit, I can't feel it. Maybe I should drink another one. And then the next thing you know, it's compounded and you got somebody that's a little bit of a, you know, a noob is a little bit sick or a little bit spun cookies, or is this kind of a gradual, you'll start to feel it kind of like a, a beer buzz. How does that, how does it break out? Break down? So it's, it's similar to a beer buzz because you're, you're right with edibles, you know, a lot of people will eat an edible and it's like, I don't feel anything. <laughs> and, then, uh -huh. and then pretty soon it hits. And then it's, and it can be really hard for those people who have never had an edible before. Uh, but with our products, uh, you drink it like a beer, and in about 15 to 20 minutes, you start feeling that the gradual buzz coming on. And uh, uh, mainly because of the, the emulsion and um, the way it goes into your system. So it's not as fast as smoking. If you want, if you want to yeah. like quickly go ahead and, and have a joint or, or a dab, uh, you'll get high real quick. If you want to just kind of socialize with friends and, and, and kind of drink and socialize, our products will, will get, get you feeling good in about 15 to 20 minutes. And then it'll stay in your system for about an hour to hour and a half. And then, and then you, you gradually get back to normal. Um, but uh, with edibles, a lot of people don't realize with edibles, what, what those do is they go through your system and then your liver changes uh, the Delta 9 THC into Delta, Delta 11, which is a more potent form and, and that's and that's why it can really hit hard with an edible and uh so yeah you, you and it can last for a long time that's why some people who have too many edibles they end up getting couch locked for hours they're just there <laughs> they don't move and it's because of that more potent form uh, of of delta 9 thc that your liver uh creates yeah, you remember those commercials from growing up where the girls just deflated on the couch and they're like, this is what happens. That's what happens if you eat like 50 milligrams of Doja and have no plans to leave the house. I love that feeling and I look for that sometimes, <laughs> but you're right. You know, like, it's not like you're just eating a gummy as well and waiting on it. It's like you're socializing and drinking a beer. You're not sitting around and like guzzling beer all day, are you? It's the same way with the can of beer. You'll just casually drink it. And as you continue to just casually drink it, the side effects will slowly come along just as the beer. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and the nice part about beer is that, you know, you drink 12 ounces and, and you, you feel good. And then you drink another 12 ounces and you could have maybe three. And then all of a sudden your, your stomach gets full. And, and that's kind of the, the nice stopping point for most people. And it's like, Oh, you know, I'm full. I, I can't have any more. Whereas uh, sometimes with, with uh, edibles, chocolates or gummies at 10 milligrams a piece, you know, you might, pop one, two, three, and, and it might take a bunch before your, your, your stomach is full. But by that time, you may have had 50 to 75 uh, milligrams of, of edibles and you could get in trouble. Some people could get in trouble and get couch locked real easy. That is a good point. It is a, a little bit more of a draw. It's a, almost like a safety reserve on itself. And the, the fact that it's yeah. a beer form, like obviously, yeah, it's a Belgian wheat and then a, an IPA and, no one's putting those things in a funnel or, you know, like trying to play beer pong with them. So it is just casual sipping buzzes. So I like it. That's a great concept. You're on to something here, Keith. 
And as, <laughs> as someone who is a little bit ahead of their time with creating this podcast, I mean, I'm, I'm being facetious there, to another person that is revolutionary, I say bravo, that's well played. I like it. <laughs> no, well, thank you. But yeah, and the good part too is that our beers can be paired up with food. Uh, I mean, you could have, uh, you know, our-, our uh, It's a grill and chill buzz. Oh, gosh, yeah, you can, you can grill almost anything and our beers will go well with that. Uh, go go get a couple hamburgers, uh, get a Whopper, and our IPA goes well with that. Sit by the, it pairs well with sitting by the pool or sitting by, you know, the the river or lake, you know, like it travels well for those that like to have a beer on the top of the mountain. Try yeah. out the can of beer, you know, get your head right, you know, wherever you may be. It's a nice, oh, versatile, yeah. it's a nice versatile buzz, Keith. But, um, and I appreciate you joining us to tell us a lot about, you know, not only your history, but also about the Syria. But you're not out of the woods yet. We want to know a little bit about Keith, the, the genius, Keith, the revolutionary, what Keith does as a native in Colorado. Um, and these are just fun questions. We always like to ask our guests just to kind of get to know him a little bit. Um, you know, one thing we kind of referenced, you mentioned joints and dabs, the can of beer and things of that nature. What's your preferred way? Do you smoke? Do you get high? I, I, I have vapes, but for me, my, my preferred way is just through my beers. I love, I love drinking beer. It's, I'm a beer guy. I love it. Um, and I like IPAs. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'll usually uh, drink a couple of our IPAs. They're uh, just a great way to relax. And after, after a stressful, hectic day, a couple IPAs makes, makes the pain go away. So <laughs> nicely done. Well played. Riddle me this. Have you substituted beer out of your diet now? Or, or do you every now and then you get the itch for a different craft beer or just a basic, you know, a yellow belly banquet? Oh, gosh. Yeah. It's, well, it's funny because uh, when I was at uh, uh, Blue Moon and uh, it's part of Coors, uh, at one point they asked me to uh, lead a team to reformulate the banquet beer. So I did that in 2001 and uh, reformulated the banquet beer. And uh, it, it, because it was, it was in those days, the uh, sales of Banquet were going down and down and down for since they launched Coors Light in 1978. And so by 1999, uh, they had tried everything. And so they asked me to reformulate it. So I put a small team together. We reformulated the Banquet beer and it, it, I, we smoothed it out, um, used different hops, but, but all this, the changes, they, they were a little more than subtle to really make it smooth and easy to drink. And um, it almost had like a vanilla aftertaste. Like, you know, like it was just so easy. You could just sip on them all day. It felt like it yeah, was delicious. And, and yeah, we, we, yeah, so we, I think we were real successful. So it went from years of declining sales into like a, I think it was like a 17 or 18 year growth spurt. And so, uh, so that did really well. And uh, you so, really are a fucking genius. That's awesome. So uh, what, are you kind of like a snob when it comes to beer? Like if you go out to a restaurant with the wife or do you stay clear of beer because you're like, I don't want something out of a, a bad tap or I don't like these. Or can you just find yourself in it? You can be happy with any beer anywhere. I think I could be happy with any beer. The, um, yeah, I'm, I've been a beer judge since gosh, 1993. <laughs> I, I judge at the great American beer festival. Oh, I love that thing. That's always a good time. Oh, it's fun. Yeah. And I've traveled as far as Japan to, to judge beer competitions. Um, Get the so, fuck out. What's your, yeah. what's your favorite country you visited to uh, judge beer? I would say Japan because it it's is? a whole different experience compared to like Australia and, and Europe, uh, United States. I've, I've been down in uh, South America judging. Japan is they have this whole, it's almost like a ritual, you know, for, for beer and judging. And it's a, it's a whole different culture. So it was, it was kind of fun. <laughs> what that is. So, okay. So unrelated to beer, what was your favorite city to travel to? Is it all, are you going to say Tokyo again, but like no. food, food wise or like, Oh man, greatest vacation or greatest trip ever. It seems like you're a worldly guy. I think that the, the funnest city was actually Belgium. Because it's, it really has, you know, Brussels is this international city, and there's so much history, so much food and beer. Uh, it's just this, this fun city, and it's it's also the place where I got my PhD. So it's like a almost like a second home. It's fun, although there was a lot of weird stuff they do there. Like uh, the, uh, I, I was there as a senior classman, so for me, 
I didn't have to go through any hazing, uh, but for the brewing school, they had hazing for the undergrads. 